Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to JFree906 and the Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream. And thank you guys for coming here today. We have a very, very special show for you today. Uh, I, uh, I've been loving this series. It is the Templars TV series uh, uh, by filmmaker Luca Santoni. And uh, we have talked a little bit about episode number one, episode number two. And today we are going to be talking about the release. Uh, of episode number three and it's uh, behind the scenes and we've got some very special guests today um, now coming with Luca Santoni we got Gretchen Cornwall and of course we have Andrea uh, de Robalant uh, is going to be joining I hope I pronounced that correctly sir uh, but anyway uh, they are going to be joining us on the show uh, I've got a little bit of green tea that I'm enjoying here this afternoon in the Oak Island Cup uh, and uh, we hope you guys enjoy the show, and it's going to be a lot of fun, very informative. So sit back and relax, and we will start in just a few moments uh, right after this. This is Robert Clotworthy, the narrator of The Curse of Oak Island, and I have a question for you. Could it be that you are listening to The Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream? This is a top pocket find, mate, for sure. All right, everyone, welcome back, and here we are, and we have our very special guest, Luca Santoni. Andrea D. Uh, Robelant and also Gretchen Cornwall. Thank you all very much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. I tell Thank you, it you. has been uh, very uh, special to have you on once before, Luca, and talking about your Templars TV series. This particular set of films is, in my opinion, fantastic. Very well done. Um, and folks, for those of you who have not seen this before or you don't know much about it, they are... Oh, available on Amazon, and I do have a link below in the description of the show where you can find them and purchase them. Very well done. And actually, I think number three that we're going to be talking about today is the best of the group so far. Stunning video. We're going to be showing some pieces of that. Luca, uh, let's start with you. And I know you're, uh, you know, you're a little bit of your background, but I don't know that everyone else does. So if you don't mind, give us a little bit of your background and what got you started with the Templars. Welcome to all, first of all, and um, my background uh, started over 35 years ago when I started this job. Uh, I, this is the 88 uh, movie I have done, uh, all documentaries, no fictional, and uh, everything started uh, when I was around 20 years old, but I grew up better 
in the profession later on around 23. So it was a kind of long time ago, but uh, a lot of experience. And Templars is just the last of my eight TV series uh, in the career. Uh, I started with uh, the first, uh, now what is the first episode? Templars and the Da Vinci Code Secrets, but before that was um, a movie. It was not a series at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the great success on Prime Video, Amazon Prime Video, we reached over 6 million visions. We decided to create this series. Mm -hmm. So it's something that started later uh, during the pandemic period. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I've been releasing all the episodes yeah, distant from time. each other. And um, right now we release them every four to five months, including the film set in the editing and the release time. And of course, every episode is different. Mm -hmm. um, by this uh, episode three, we have uh, two new guests, very important. Um, Gretchen Cornell, of course, and Andrea Di Robilan, that will uh, lead um, episode the three and four, and the Gretchen will be up to episode five. Uh, that uh, is going to be the last one of uh, season one. Okay. So um, this is pretty much uh, my very short introduction of myself. <laughs> But you can find more stuff on Google, just Google my first and last name, mm -hmm. and we'll find it all, especially on imdb.com. And I tell you what, in, in th that is, and I have a link below. Um, I hope I, I didn't ask you pre uh, ahead of time if I could share that, but as a sh I shared the link to your, uh, to your uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, well, thank you. And <laughs> I should have asked before I did that, but I meant to in the pre-show. But anyway, uh, I do have that link down below for your YouTube channel. It's in the description below as well as for Gretchen. Uh, and speaking of the lovely Gretchen Cornwall, you know, you are in this episode doing what you do best, giving us an education uh, of all the research you've learned uh, about the Templars and about the entire area, quite honestly. Um, most everyone that has watched this show knows who you are, but Gretchen, if you don't mind, you are author and researcher. And tell us a little bit about Gretchen Cornwall. Goodness. Um, <laughs> biographies are always spot, right? free. Uh, <laughs> I uh, came across the Knights Templar basically in 1995. And I can't explain the phenomena that happened at that juncture, but that was it for me. And I was captivated. And I have been applying myself to researching everything I can get my hands on, which is never enough as far as I'm concerned, because travel is involved in that. And you really do have to be on location where authors may have that came before you may have missed structural content, graffiti marks, the lay of the town itself, the medieval city and town itself, locations nearby that are actually key to understanding the Templar story. Uh, in brief, Chateau de la Rochefoucauld in France, which many of you who watch Oak Island are uh, commiserate with, uh, understand that it's important to know that there is a Templar knight church within a 30 mile uh, uh excuse me a 30 minute drive uh -huh. and above the the uh, entryway is a carving of a mermaid the mermaid is the symbol for the house of rochefoucauld so that means there had to have been some money changing hands there perhaps they gave some money to the church and supported that church it's quite small uh so they would have said thank you to the the uh Rochefort called house by by placing their family emblem above the main doorway the main portal so right. it's those types of things that can help put together a broader story right. and i was so taken with uh Irresistible North by uh, Andrea. As far as I'm concerned, it's the definitive book, and we'll get into this as uh, as the program goes on. Definitive book on the the down and dirty nuts and bolts of of the Zeno brothers 
and transatlantic voyages. And what I was so taken with is I, I didn't know, I've heard the name Zeno brothers or Zen brothers in the mm -hmm, past, right. but what I didn't know is that decades after their work ceased, um, and and uh, new generations spray, sprang up. Uh, they were wealthy people, and they built a palace. And I went online, and I looked at their palace frontage, and there are weddings that are held there now. Right. I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful. This was a very, very important family. And so buildings and place can tell us so much uh, when the prior books fail. And... Um, Oh, that's wonderful, Linda. Yeah, mm -hmm. I uh, yeah. Well, James McQuiston is an amazing researcher about the history of Round Oak Island. Absolutely. Um, uh, so I I hope that expresses in brief my fascination, mm -hmm. fascination from an anthropology point of view too. These are people, right. and there are legends, fantastical legends. Um, in some of them, obviously improbable. Uh, not possible, but the wealth of information through their uh, uh, current fiction, uh, such as uh, Chrétien de Troyes, uh, Grail, uh, Arthur stories, and that they bear a bit of a resemblance to the Knights Templar. So all these bits of information from anthropology to the culture at the time, courtly love, uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine, <laughs> <laughs> Matilde uh, of Tuscany, mm. on and on and on. So it's important to try to steep yourself as much as you can in these people's lives to try right. to get a better understanding of what they did. Yep, and that's because exactly why we need you guys. <laughs> because of what they did that mm -hmm. we all want to understand. Right. And um, uh, so I hope that helps in some way. Absolutely. And like I said, that's exactly why we need uh, the folks like yourself uh, and uh, Jim McQuiston and also you, Gretchen, and also Andrea. Um, you uh, and I was just I, I honestly I have to say I, I had never heard of your book uh, prior to watching uh, Luca's episode. Um, and then, of course, uh, hearing from uh, James McQuiston, who reached out and said uh, what he what he just announced just now or what Linda had said. <laughs> Uh, about your book. Um, and I, I have to get it now. And I don't have the link for it below, but I am going to put it in there for everyone else later on. I'll put the link in there of where they can get this book. Yeah, I'm going to go there and get it. Sir, tell me a little bit about you and uh, your uh, the book. We'll get into the depth of your book later, uh, but just tell us a little bit about Andrea, please. Well, I'm, uh, um, I'm uh, Italian, uh, though my mother is American, and mm -hmm. I live in Rome, and I'm talking to you from the seaside in Italy, in Tuscany, which Luca knows very well. I would love um, to be there. And uh, I was a journalist for most of my uh, life, mm -hmm. and so I bring to this story a sort of journalistic uh, approach, a sort of journalistic and academic uh, approach. Mm -hmm. um, I'm now mostly, I write books and I, and I teach at American University in, in, uh, in Rome. Um, uh, I, I, I must say, well, first of all, thank you so much, Gretchen, for your kind words, and, and Luca as well, and Jeff for having me on the show. Uh, I must say that I, I come to this whole story of the Templars uh, in a sort of tangential way, in the sense that the, the Zeno narrative runs parallel to this. Um, and I kind of stumbled onto this story. I, I had no idea who the Zeno brothers was. Uh, the Venetians called call them Zen, the Zen family. Mm -hmm. they, they don't use the O at the end, but I'll, I'll use the name Zeno uh, for the sake of clarity because otherwise people might confuse it with the Japanese Zen. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so um, I kind of stumbled onto the story of the Zeno brothers. Uh, I was, one day I was uh, writing uh, in, and researching in the in the uh, public library in Venice. And a gentleman, an American tourist in shorts, stumbled into the hall and uh, was looking for a book. And so I, I saw that he was uh, having some difficulty. And so I offered to help. And uh, he told me he had just come off a cruise ship in Venice uh, and uh, had wandered into the library. And he had with him a little piece of paper and on this piece of paper were the names of Niccolo and Antonio Zen, Zeno. Um, 
and uh, the names didn't mean anything to me. But he said to me, well, in the town where I come from, in I think it was Connecticut, um, uh, we all know that uh, these two Venetians came to uh, the American continent uh, in, in the 14th century. And I looked at him in disbelief and thought that, uh, well, some weird people come off those cruise ships and uh, uh, this man was, uh, was one of them. Uh, but still, so we, I said goodbye to him. I, I tried to actually, I told him where the, 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 the home of the Zeno brothers was. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually a picture, there's a picture of, the, of the Palazzo in, here in the book. Uh, because it is, as Gretchen was saying, it's a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating palazzo with a, a very interesting history and uh, a very interesting architecture. Anyway, uh, so I, 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 he wanted to have a picture taken in front of the palazzo of the Zeno brothers so he could go back home and show to his friends that, uh, that he'd been in Venice and had been at the palazzo. So I sent him on his way. Um, and shaking my head, actually. But then uh, see, I was intrigued by the whole thing. And since I was, I happened to be in the library. I said, well, maybe there's something I can find in here, right here in the Venice, in, in the Venice library. And lo, lo and behold, uh, I did find um, the original book uh, published in 1550 uh, by the uh, grand nephew of the two brothers who lived in the 14th century. So we have Niccolo and Antonio who lived in the 14th century. Uh, and the book was assembled by their grandson, Nic Niccolo Jr., let's call him uh, Niccolo Jr. And the, that original book, uh, which is a compendium of their travels to the North Atlantic, and this extraordinary map, uh, of that area. Uh, well, the original book was right there under my nose in the Venetian library. Uh, and so this got me seriously interested in this. I said, why have I never heard of these people? Two Venetians who explore the North American continent. Not only that, but they go to the, to the Faroes and to Iceland, to Greenland and to uh, uh, Newfoundland and possibly Nova Scotia. Why have I never heard of these? Uh, well, there's a reason for that, and, and maybe we'll get into, into that. But I, I, that's when I started uh, researching uh, the story. And, and what came out of this research was, was this fascinating story of these two uh, Venetian navigators, two Venetian merchants who had uh, you know, rigged up their cog and had gone on the, on the trading route uh, uh, out of the Mediterranean and up the, the Atlantic and into the channel. Uh, and that was a, a relatively new route for Venetians, but they realized that uh, it was not enough to dominate the Mediterranean trade if they wanted to maintain their leadership in, in, in world trade. And so they, they had to uh, make room for themselves in the channel and uh, and, and, and that part of the world. And so that's why they were there, really. And then they were hit by a, a storm that uh, led them astray and they lost control of their cog. And they ended up, uh, they ended up land crash landing in what was probably uh, either the Orkneys or the, uh, or the Faroe Islands. That part of the world was then dominated uh, by by um, Sir Henry Sinclair, who was a, a very important uh, uh, ruler in that area of the world, and uh, they uh, they went to work for him, and and from those islands they decided then to move on and to navigate further north, uh, meaning they went uh, well as I said to the Faroes and then beyond to Iceland. Mm -hmm. They certainly went to Greenland and possibly to the North American coast. Then eventually, after 10 years, they made their way back to Venice. One of the brothers died. The other one, Antonio, managed to reach Venice. And so uh, they had taken notes and written letters during these 10 years. So there was a massive amount of information about this trip. Where did all this information end up? Well, 
It ended up like it always did in the family libraries. I mean, Venetian merchants had ex the, the, the major merchant, merchant families had extraordinary libraries in which they collected all these uh, materials. And so this, the, the, this material ended up in the Zeno family library, right? So then you, you, uh, you fast forward um, uh, two generations and the young uh, Niccolo uh, Zeno, uh, who is the, the great nephew of one of the two, uh, a very important person uh, in Venice, uh, belonging to the ruling class, um, a humanist, highly educated, uh, and, and one who had worked in very important positions in the, in the uh, Venetian government. He was a, an expert in hydraulics, so he was uh, responsible for a lot of the work in the lagoon and so on. Anyway, I'm not going to... So he, uh, as, a, as a humanist and as an intellectual and, and very interested in his fam own family history, said, I have to, you know, this is the time to put all of this together and to publish it. Why was it important at that time? Well, because we're in the early 16th century. So the world is opening up. There have been so many geographical discoveries, right? And so we, we, we're still looking to draw the map of the world as it was. Uh -huh. uh, so Venice was then the capital of the book industry uh, and, and map making. Venice was really the hub of these activities. Uh, there were map makers and publishers galore in Venice in those, uh, in those years. And so there was a lot of excitement around this project of publishing the Zeno material and the map. And Niccolò is the man who is responsible for stitching the narrative together and for preparing uh, the map for, for publication. The book came out in 1550, if I, if, I, if I remember correctly. And of course, it had a huge impact uh, because cartographers um, who were trying to, the great carto cartographers of the of those years, Ortelius, Mercator, and all and and others, were trying to figure out what that portion of the world looked like, what the North Atlantic looked like. There was very little material with which to work, and so it was kind of still a blank. And in all of this comes this book with the map, and the map is exactly the area that was still so much of a question mark. Uh, and so the map circulated in Europe uh, and the book, and it was very uh, influential. And uh, just one more thing, and then I'll stop because I'm going on too much here. But, it's hard not to, oh, it's, no. okay. it's okay. This is very book, educational, thank you. The, the Absolutely. Book, most importantly, the book ended up in the hands of a man called John Dee. And, and John Dee is a, a crucial figure in the, in the English Renaissance. He was the very, very close advisor to Queen Elizabeth. He was a mathematician, a geographer, an astrologer, uh, and an astronomer, both, both things. Um, and he was the closest advisor to the queen. He was fascinating by, by, by the book and by the Zeno map. And, um, uh, and he realized that he could use this map as a basis for the organization of British expeditions to the North Atlantic to establish an empire in North America, right? This was a time when the Spaniards already had their empire in, in the Americas, the French had their uh, uh, empire, the Portuguese had their empire, and the British were behind everybody. And so right. John Dee prepares four crucial documents establishing the foundations of this in, uh, imperial adventure, uh, in which he fixed the historical and uh, legal basis for these expeditions. The expeditions were entrusted to Martin Frobisher, who was one of the great navigators of uh, the for age. Them, eh? and, <clears throat> and under orders from Queen Elizabeth, Martin Frobisher began his, uh, this uh, extraordinary, these three expeditions to North America. Now, what to me is absolutely fascinating is that Frobisher uses the Zeno map word for word, I mean, the, the text and the map word for word to get himself over to the other side. 
and to go to the Faroes, Iceland, Greenland, uh, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and back, right? And, and uh, it's really extraordinary to see, to read the logs of those three expeditions because he is constantly referring to the Zeno brothers uh, and constantly referring to the place names uh, inscribed in the narrative of the uh, Zeno brothers. Um, and, and so I always found it fascinating that uh, the Zeno brother narrative and the map played such a, a huge role in the establishment of a British empire in, uh, in North America. And I think I'll quit here, <laughs> because otherwise I'm just going yeah. on and on. <laughs> Andrea, I'm finding this absolutely. I know, crazy. so am I. I know that everybody else is going absolutely crazy right now. Well, I, wait, let me just finish. But then, yeah. you know why? Why the Brits didn't know about this? Why? I mean, because the question is, hey, wait a minute. The, these this narrative of the Venetian brothers who were traveling under the auspices of Sir Henry Sinclair. Why, why don't history books talk about this? Why right. books on the British Empire don't tell us about uh, this uh, uh, foundation? Mm -hmm. And the reason is that the four documents I was talking about earlier, uh, prepared by John Dee, remember John Dee prepared these four documents that were the basis for the political decision to launch the expeditions, right? Four mm -hmm. crucial documents. Well, they were lost. Nobody knew anything about them. Oh, wow. Wow. Nobody knew anything about them. In those four documents by John Dee, John Dee express, expressively says to the queen, we have to follow the indications of the Zeno brothers. And he goes into detail about the narrative. It's really quite extraordinary and wonderful. Those four documents were lost and they reappeared on the uh, antiquarian market in 1976 and were purchased by the British Library. And there wow. you can finally read them. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I, I just found this, this whole story uh, really quite, quite uh, riveting. But anyway, there's it more. Is. Yes. It, it truly know. is. Um, you, you've just <laughs> hit so many nails on, you know, Yep. Uh, uh, but uh, there's a large contingent of Oak Island followers, uh, theorists, um, who have put together the court of Queen Elizabeth. John and John D plays a critical role, and so it's really special to have you here today to talk about that. And unfortunately, these, some of these documents are so old they get wet, they they fall apart because of damp, they get they get caught fire, people steal them, they they get lost, you know, and that's a perfect example of how these precious documents can just go if we're not oh, yeah. diligent yep. and, and protective of them. And um, I, so I, that just, you know, kudos to you for, for putting all this together, this important foundational information. And I didn't realize that, that the Elizabethan court was behind uh, the other powers in their am imperial ambitions. You know, uh, uh, um, English-speaking people are really familiar with the, the might of the British Empire. But, you know, there are other people out there who were, who were you know, battling for power uh, mm -hmm. as well. And, and um, so, you know, this is a global thing. But um, my, my train of thought is this. Venice is so, so important to the Templar story. Uh, in Accra, Israel, the last stronghold, the last castle uh, of, of the Templar order there, um, they were, uh, their main fortress, they were right next to the Venetian quarter. They bought ships from Venice, they leased them, they hired their navigators, on and on and on. There was a really close tie between the Templars and the Venetians, and that, that lasted for a very long time. So I'm not surprised that this legacy of, of uh, and skill of you know, the, the Zen brothers uh, was, was at the forefront. They, they come from centuries of, of this navigation and sea craft. And a cog is a type of, of ship 
that um, uh, it would be called a ship today, but it's it's they they weren't that big if I'm if I'm remembering right. And of course they had these wonderful sails. And Andrea, can can you refresh my memory? Is a cog? Uh, did they take a basic ship and put a tower on the front, tower on the back? Is that right? Oh, thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. That's important to understand yeah. the kind of craft they were working with. Right. Thank you. That's wonderful. I appreciate That's that. Um, yeah. Is that in I'll your book, Andre? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> yes. And you know, you know what's so in impressive about your book is you do not waste time on fluff. You do not gild <laughs> the lily. You you well, it's fact. I was trained fact. as a journal, so fact and and i so appreciated that but you also made it a journey your journey you took us with you and you you talked to us about the people that you met um some were helpful to you others were were negative about your your quest and um i loved how you, you tied it all up at the end with a particular individual um that was good fun um uh would this i'm just asking would this be a good time to show the film clip yes it was yes, and i was going to ask before we do that luca how did you how did you find andrea how did you get him uh yeah how did him? you find me <laughs> i found him uh, in the uh, books that i was able to rescue in italy as information not physically and did i have to read it in english because i have an english version in italy is uh, sold out for a long time and in America, still, there are some few books left, and uh, he's probably going to republish it soon. Well, I don't and, know. I have uh, to ask my publishing house why they're not available. Yeah. But it, it, the book, yeah, because they're all, sold. they're all sold. They're all sold. <laughs> They're all sold. Yes, that's it. Well, you know, maybe we, maybe our uh, audience can help you out with that and go out there and start buying the book. That that yes, would help. That would and, be uh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's help. available on Kindle. But yeah. Well, I mean, and, and Linda, Linda said, yeah, so Linda is our uh, one of our uh, administrators for the Facebook group, and she helps with the YouTube channel as well. And Linda actually put up, and, and along with Jan uh, Anderson and Tom, uh, but Linda actually put up there that it is available in Amazon. And I will link it. I'll put it in the link of the show. We'll have it. Yeah, down you there. can find some of their names still on Amazon. Yeah. Okay. May, while we're talking about links, may I just drop this in quickly? Uh, uh, the film that was released on October 13th, a few days ago, is available only in the UK amazon prime and amazon usa uh mm -hmm. prime so um i've been getting messages how you know i'm in australia or i'm in canada etc so so at this juncture and and perhaps unfortunately you know forever uh if you're in the usa great and in the uk terrific but um i just wanted to to share that with everybody and uh i, I can add uh, further information when the series will be finished next year we're going to put the entire series also on other web platforms. So it's going to be available worldwide uh, in different languages at that point. All right. All right. Great. Great. Yeah, All right. Have a, there's the link. Oh, it's the, the link has been put up onto the Facebook side, uh, which brought it over also to the YouTube side. So thank you, whoever. I don't have a name that uh, who did that, but thank you for doing that. Uh, and I also have it in the description of the show. We'll take you right to at least the American side for the Amazon to take you right there where all three of the episodes are available. Uh, I went there myself and bought episode number three so that I could watch it in preparation for this. And I tell you, like I said earlier, uh, we're going to show a clip here in just a moment. Oh, and there's the link for um, Andrea's book is now linked on there as well. So you guys can see that. Um, so, yes, I, I can't wait to get this book, quite honestly, because uh, if it comes from the recommendation of Gretchen, and uh, James McQuiston, two people that I, I hold very high esteem. I tell you, I'm going to read this book and I'm going to get some more information. Well, that's that's very I've to I've dog-eared every single page, literally. <laughs> I've, I, I've written in every page and posted notes. Oh, I mean, literally, literally. Yeah. Tom Burns does that too with the books that he gets. He goes through and he puts them all in there. So, it's yeah. really helpful. Yeah, I, he... Sometimes I'll even buy two copies. I'll buy a copy I want to keep. And I'll buy a copy. I'll just note shred. 
but, yeah, so you could sh- yeah, write all your notes. Yeah, a working know. copy. A working yes, copy. yeah, there you go. Per- perfect, perfect name for it. Working copy. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've so never I- had so much publicity in my life. Okay. <laughs> so, Luca, what were you saying? I would say that uh, your work definitely is notoriety because it's really something very different from everybody else as published right now, even in TV. So, um, it's something that preceded Columbus that is already, <laughs> in my opinion, a past situation because, uh, of course, Henry Sinclair and the Zeno brothers arrived there, but the Vikings were there first. And indeed, that's why in episode four, we we're going to talk more about the Vikings, especially mm. on a female perspective that is going to mm. be good reader, Turbiana Doctor. Very difficult name, but uh, she is uh, she was part of uh, Eric the Red family, and uh, highlighted uh, especially in the series now Valhalla uh, from Eric the Leaf, mm. Eric Leaf, and um, um, his uh, s- sister. So it's something that uh, you find in the story. Uh, of a good read, uh, very close. So she was an important family to, in to the put, Viking in the Viking times. To put this in some context, didn't you tell me, Luca, that Gudrid was related to Freydis? That yes. is a main character in Vikings. She, she married uh, uh, the uh, brother of uh, Eric. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the son of Eric the Red and the, mm-hmm. the brother of Leif. So brotherly. Yeah. Okay. And so did she come over to uh, North America? She was the very first to give uh, birth to a European in uh, North America. Wow. According with the sagas, of course. Right. And uh, the most important, and I had uh, an evidence of that, uh, in the later part of uh, latest part of her life, she went to the Vatican, invited by the Pope. Yes, who wanted yes. to know the what he, she had seen during her, her travel in uh, North America, mm-hmm. and uh, she went there like uh, like uh, with a, a pilgrim, together with a Icelandic monk. Going to Rome, they stop uh, sleeping in Alto Pascio village in Tuscany, oh. which is also in episode three and is the place of origin of the nine Templars who gave life to the movement. But that's part of the movie. I don't want to anticipate it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that whole story is, it's is all connected. It's all really yeah. connected. We yeah. did a lot of job. Um, Gretchen and I to find out all this information and we are still uh, taking on because um, next episode is going to be very different but very much on women's side more than ever. L- Luca has has lined up uh, a, a wonderful novelist but also uh, two non-fiction historical writers about that time period that I believe include Gudrid in their writings. So looking forward to hearing from these these women who, doesn't one live in, in Iceland uh, or, or is it Norway? I'm sorry, Luca. Actually, you are mentioning about the writers of Gudrid Turbandor here, okay. Yeah. There is a uh, Nancy Mary Brown who lives in Vermont, but she always traveled to Iceland and uh, we will go in to interview her in uh, episode four and also Margaret Elphiston in Scotland. And um, there is uh, Heather Gilbert as well. And uh, before them in 1918, so 105 years ago, another writer from England wrote uh, a book that was exactly entitled like episode four, Goodry the Fair. So, and that's uh, a more romantic uh, introduction to the 
character of her, but uh, it's very interesting. I like that too. All right. So I tell you what, should we show the? Uh, I've got the first one queued up here. Uh, this is the uh, the teaser number one. Do we want to go ahead and run that one real quick? Sure. sure. Okay, folks, we're going to show a few of these, and uh, and um, this shows some of the stunning uh, aerial photography, photography in general and um some of the landscapes and whatnot and and again we're going to show a few of these clips as we go along here um and you to give you a taste of what this series is about in this particular episode so i'm going to go ahead and bring this up and then as soon as we have it up i will um i'm going to make it full screen actually and then i will run it and then when it's finished we'll we'll come right back so here we go All right. So let me, uh, I have you guys muted. Sorry. Cause it was Alaska. getting a little, whoops. That's why you need the new. Oops. Sorry. Let me get that off there. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Wow. That's, uh, that's very impressive. Um, that intro right there, that teaser trailer, uh, and, you know, showing some of the places, uh, that you went. And as Gretchen mentioned earlier, that is something that I think is very important. Unfortunately, some of us can't, you know, just hop around and drive around. Oh, I'm going to go visit this castle today or whatever, uh, for those of us in the United States anyway. But I think that's very true that to really get a sense of the story, you have to see the location, like you mentioned, uh, Gretchen. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, and it gives you an idea as a human being. Uh, and they were still human beings, you know, they, they might have been a little bit shorter, they might not have reached their genetic potential through good nutrition. Mm -hmm. But these hardier breeds that were very healthy, very uh, capable of battle that did grow to their genetic potential, uh, they had to deal with these landscapes. And northern Scotland, in Norway, the Scandinavian uh, lands are very inhospitable. Um, and difficult, uh, Iceland, Greenland. And one of the things I appreciated about Andrea's book is that he does give an indication of the challenges that these people faced and uh, life and death uh, challenges. But um, I, I just uh, so appreciate the drone footage uh, oh filmed by Lucas San Paolo. He's very gifted, very talented. And is it episode one, uh, the Da Vinci Code, uh, Luca, where he, he's given access to Ren Le Chateau, the church? And actually, no, no, I'm, 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 forgive me. Actually, forgive me. episode oh, one is the only one I never. I did. am so sorry. It's uh, Luca Bracali who did it. I apologize. <laughs> oh, it's okay. You but anyway, still... you, you know, you must see the see episode three to, to understand the full scale of Paolo's capacity as a drone pilot. Some of the uh, film footage was was actually done at a great distance, and you know, Luca was telling me, "Oh yeah, this was filmed X number of of." impossible distance away, you know, to re to maintain control of that drone in bad weather <laughs> and at difficult times uh, uh, approaching evening or even in the dark. Incredible work. Uh, very skilled. Absolutely. Um, uh, so, yeah. So uh, w would you like 
Luca, what would you like to do? Would you like to see another? Um... I would like to uh, show the real trailer because the teaser we have made it when the trailer wasn't still ready. So right. I would go with that. Um, let's see. Is that the one? Let's see. I've got a couple here. Um, that Gretchen sent me. This is trailer I mean, episode three. It's probably yeah. the second trailer, one. That I trailer sent episode you. three is the okay. title. Okay, um, yeah, okay, here it is. Yeah, I'm... the second one that I sent to you is, okay. is correct. All right, and that is this one right yeah, here, I believe, correct. starts off with it. Okay, so we're going to run this one, folks. This one is four minutes uh, and 20 seconds, uh, and uh, we'll check this out. Again, sit back and enjoy. These are fantastic. The Triangle Castle of Calaverock of the Lords of Clan Maxwell. Fortifications have been built here since the 6th century. According to a 12th century manuscript, the Battle of Arthuret took place here in 573. Merlin the Wild followed his king onto the battlefield. When all was lost, Merlin fled for his life into the forest. He lived peacefully with the animals and was given to the gift of prophecy. Could this long ago battle have been the inspiration behind Merlin of King Arthur's court? Lincluden Collegiate Church, visited by the famous poet Robert Burns, and was inspired to write The Minstrel of Lincluden. Had the tomb of the 15th century Princess Margaret given him pause for thought, she is indeed resting in an ivy bower. Ye old trip to Jerusalem, a Templar pub and inn, a bar. Originally, it's thought that the name would have been the Pilgrim or Pilgrim. Essentially, that is the mission statement of the Knights Templar to guard pilgrims on their travels. So Nottingham is a key crossroads on the pilgrimage trail and also the crusading trail. Ye old trip, the oldest pub in England, 1189, is at the base of Nottingham Castle, a key central location. It is so charming. There isn't a straight bit of woodwork in the entire pub.
All right, so let's uh, hold on a second, and I will get you all back in here. There we go. I wanted to make sure you were unmuted. Wow. Uh, again, this is just a portion of what we're going to see. This is um, fantastic. So uh, during the uh, during the making of this thing, uh, and as I watched it, I watched this episode on um, on Amazon. And I finished actually watching it last night. Um, you know, I was very uh, taken back by the amount of information, not only the amount of information that's in here. And then we also have a piece where Andrea comes on and he also does an interview uh, and gives some information here as well and brought up some names that I had heard but had no idea who they were. And that's something that, you know, like you talk about the, the, uh, and I guess it's not really a, I guess it would be a city of uh, uh, um, Saborga. Um, that's going to be coming up in here in just a little bit. And then also Matilda, the name Matilda. I, I had no, I heard that name, but I did not have any idea who the person was uh, that carried that name. So this is really fascinating. And then, of course, some of the um, Bernard de Clairvaux that we uh, uh, also hear uh, brought up in this as well. So, um this portion here, if you don't mind, uh, I was going to say, Gretchen, on this portion here, you talk about this particular pub. Now, this was on the route of the pilgrimage for the uh, that the people would take, that the Templars were there to protect them? Yes, and there are various pilgrimages, uh, such as uh, from the north to the south uh, to Canterbury, the Rome of England, if you will, where the arch. Bishop of Canterbury uh, resides. Canterbury is an incredibly important place. So Nottingham was a pivotal location for being able to stop over and continue to head south to uh, either to Canterbury or to the port of Dover, where the Templars also uh, had a large uh, foothold, if you will, a uh, very famous chapel there at, at Temple Ewell above the cliffs. Uh, but you would embark from Dover uh, on the very south of England to head to either uh, to head to France and then or go, you know, to go to France and uh, or go further south mm -hmm. uh, to Portugal, etc., uh, to go on the Compostela uh, Trail uh, uh, through, through Spain. Excuse me. There, there are different pathways, different roads. But right. the ultimate uh, pilgrim as a believer would be to go to St. James of Compostela in Spain to get your seashell badge, the emblem of of St. James, very important pilgrimage. And there was a whole economy built up around the, up, around pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. uh, so so this, this pub, and I do believe this structure goes back that far. I do think it was in Templar hands. And the indication is that, that it was named Pilgrim. And that is the great remit of the Knights Templar because it's, it's like human trafficking today. Um, if you hired a boat that the, the Templars were running, you knew you weren't going to be dumped overboard in the Mediterranean and robbed. You could trust them. And the roads were very dangerous. So eventually, when they built up their network, they they were at major crossroads. They wanted to know who was coming into their territory, who was going out. Um, you could leave your, your wealth with them and take away a banknote, what we would consider a banknote, cash it in at, at the next Templar uh, preceptory. So you weren't carrying a lot of cash, gold, silver, what right. have you. So Making that you less of a target. Yeah. Less of a target. And maybe, you know, uh, I don't know if there's documentation for this, but uh, if you were wealthy enough, perhaps you could hire one to help take you down the road that's potential but i find nottingham castle to be very fascinating this pub uh, is at the base of a huge cliff and um uh the the tunnel it, it, it's um they dug into the uh cliff base and i took a tour of it many years ago and my camera wasn't very good, so the pictures weren't very good. But the tunnel in the back of the pub into the, uh, was in a cruciform shape. So there, 
their practical storage area, perhaps they even slept, people slept there, who knows, um, was in the shape of a cross. So I found that very telling. Mm -hmm. The other episode that's really interesting here is that the young Edward III, who I consider to be a Arthurian figure, he developed the Order of the Garter, and it really is all based on King Arthur. He wanted to be (laughs) King Arthur. And uh, there's some some real serious, um, I think he's, the, the King, Ar- uh, forgive me, Edward III was sympathetic to the Templars, the, and he was post-Templar. You know, the, uh, he, uh, his reign was after the Templar, uh, 1307, and the final 1312, 1314 end. So he was after all of that came along. But here he is, this young man, maybe 18, if I remember correctly. Um, his mother is in Nottingham Castle with her lord, her, with her lover, this man wanted to marry her and that was a danger to Edward III because if those two produced a child, he his life was potentially in danger. Uh-huh. So he storms the castle through secret tunnels with a small handful of men. They arrest him and execute him. Uh-huh. And he puts his mother under house arrest for basically the rest of her life. And then he's able to take his crown. So Nottingham is really interesting for that episode and these secret tunnels underneath. You can take a tour of the tunnels, but with a guide only. Uh, But they've been there for centuries and uh, all the way back to the king that gave us the Order of the Garter, the most prestigious uh, royal order in the world today where uh, you have 24 knights um, and you are a knight for your life. And it's, it's a fascinating history, the Order of the Garter. So, so I'm kind of mushing that in with everything we're doing here. But the reason why I really in, enjoy and I find the, the pilgrim in uh, or ye old trip to Jerusalem to be fascinating is because of its potential links to the Knights Templar and potentially that episode with King Edward III, who became an Arthurian king, would be Arthurian king, right. and developed the Order of the Garter. And it all happened at Nottingham. Uh, so it's key. Yes. Uh, that pub is key. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. So did you want to show? Um, I've got another clip uh, ready to go. Um, and this is the one I believe that uh, has uh, Andrea in it. Did you want to show that one now, or? Uh, um, forgive me. I will have a quick look at which one. That's behind the scenes. Oh, no, I don't is, have that one up yet. Uh, have, yeah, that's the third one I sent okay. you. Uh, I put that one together, and uh, with Luca's permission. The behind the scenes um, one. Behind the scenes, and Luca, tell me what you'd like to do. The uh, unlisted excerpt that you sent to princess nina um, i would, uh, uh, I would uh, go with that because it's the start of the episode okay and uh, we talk about seborga and after later than that we're gonna go with andrea and you okay okay so, let's see, Let me see the last I... one that i sent you okay that's the hold on a second. Is that the one that said? Well, let me see. Here, real quick. It's the unlisted segment, so you have to have the link in order to see it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I have them up here already, so I just want to make sure I have. Is that the one that says the episode three behind the scenes? No. Uh, the no. next one down. Okay, so that's the one that starts off with looking at the library, the extract. It's the one I have. Let me the show extract. you the beginning of it and see if that's. Yeah. It. Let's go with. Let's go with that, that. one. No, that one is the one with Andrea. Oh, We're okay. Go with that after that. Okay. Okay. That's the only two that I. That's the only, I only have two more. Those are the two. Yeah, it's one of the two for sure. Then. <laughs> uh, Forgive me, Luca. I I uh, I might. I thought I I sent Jeff everything I had. Um, uh, so if I'm not seeing something, well, um, tell okay, you what. Let, we're winging it anyway. Why don't we? Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, may we go with the unlisted one that you sent me, Luca? I will go with you and Andrea first. The one uh, we shot in Venice. And uh, after with you, 
as introduction of the episode. So uh, it's it's the one that Jeff just. Uh, yeah, this one here. Yeah, that one. That okay. One. All right. Thank you. All right, we'll go with this one here. All right. So this is another little. So this one's about five minutes. When we'll run this one now, and again, sit back and enjoy, folks. This is really good stuff here, and uh, here we go. The Palace of Zeno is one of the grandest in Venice. The noble Zeno family spans centuries and included a powerful doge or ruler, cardinals, senators, ambassadors, and of course, exceptional navigators. Hello, my name is Andrea Di Robilan. Uh, I'm a Venetian and the author of this book, Irresistible North, which tells the story of two Venetian brothers who in the 14th century sailed to the Northern Seas, went to Iceland, Greenland, and possibly to the northern coast of America, notably Labrador and Newfoundland. And there they uh, encounter a, a local uh, lord uh, by the name of Henry Sinclair. And uh, Henry Sinclair, who actually had been to Venice in his youth, uh, is delighted to uh, save these Venetians and to uh, comfort them and to give them uh, food and shelter uh, and they they get along very well, and Sinclair realizes that he could uh, make good use of two good, solid Venetian navigators. Mm. And of course, the navigators are are our navigators, uh, Niccolo and Antonio Zen, uh, are very thrilled to meet Henry Sinclair, who belonged to an important Scottish family and who had expanded uh, his seigneury to these archipelagos uh, in the Northern Sea. So Niccolò and Antonio Zen give up the, their earlier mission of uh, trading and then returning to Venice and stay in the service of uh, Henry Sinclair for at least 10 years. Uh, during these 10 years, they will uh, explore the Northern Seas. They will go to the Norwegian coast and from there sail on to Iceland. Uh, from Iceland, they will sail to Greenland and very possibly to the coast of North America, to Labrador and to uh, Newfoundland before making eventually their return journey to Venice. Niccolò doesn't make it, he dies during this period, but Antonio Zen returns to Venice and uh, has a, continues to have a career uh, in Venice. What is interesting is that during the long period of 10 years in which they were uh, navigating in the service of, um, uh, of Henry Sinclair, uh, they would write letters to their families in Venice quite regularly. And this is key because these letters uh, were part of the family library, the family library in this palace in front of which we are uh, standing now, which is Palazzo Zen, which was built uh, a few decades after Antonio uh, and Niccolò Zen died. In the Templar realm, the name Earl Henry Sinclair rises to the top. It fills us with mystery, a sense of adventure, wonder, did he actually sail to Nova Scotia, North America? Did he build a castle? What about the Newport Tower? Other structures? Was there a record left of his adventures? I believe that that's true that there are, and we would like to share that information with you during the course of our film. Earl Henry Sinclair was of the hardiest breed of men, a Norseman, and he had been made Earl of Northern Scotland, the family had many castles dotted about the land. And eventually his family 
would have Roslyn as well, or Roseline. The family today is still intriguing. The head of the clan in the north, the Earl Roslyn of Roslyn Chapel, his art historian, lady wife, fascinating people. All right. Wow. All right. Let me close that one here. Well, it was funny to see to to see myself uh, standing in front of Palazzo Zeno. Uh, I must say that we, uh, I had originally suggested that we do the interview there at Palazzo Zeno because, as I said, it's a very interesting palazzo architecturally. Mm -hmm. The reason you don't see more of the palazzo was that when we got there, uh, it was all covered with scaffolding, and uh, we we couldn't uh, do the shots we would have liked to uh, make. Right. Luca was very good in arranging things otherwise. <laughs> Thank you. That's fantastic. We had the exact same problem with many other locations. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's some of the thing that goes, you know, that most of us don't realize in the in the uh, operation of creating a film uh, like this, uh, you want to get a, 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 the great location. You want to be there to help explain the story. And not always can you get that exact thing that you're looking for. Uh, me, I cheat and I just go with a green screen. But, you know, really for that, you, you want to be there uh and in in the uh in the actual spot because it helps to like i said it helps to tell the story and, and going on with what gretchen said earlier um this i tell you this this has um really opened my eyes so much more as to what this whole story is all about and and the the implications that it has on our history books i mean here in the united states we've always had the you know, we grew up in school uh, learning that uh, Christopher Columbus, 1492, you know, discovered America. And now we come to find out that, oh, there was many people here in North America long before he was. So he was the one given credit for it in the history books. And now through the research of, you know, folks like Gretchen and Andrea and also the film work by uh, you, Luca, now you're bringing more of the truth out. And that is what I, I can't thank you enough for this. I applaud you for the efforts to go through this. And it opens our eyes that, uh, you know, do you think that, uh, you know, going forward, that is, this will have any impact on the history books in the future? I mean, what do you think? Is that something that you strive yeah, for? Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it takes time for stuff to filter through and, and you know, for change to take place. But I think it's already changing. Mm -hmm. Uh and uh, I, I just want to go back to the idea of, uh, that Gretchen introduced and how important it is to then um, go in the footsteps of these people and see the places they saw, talk to the people on the place. You just dis you keep discovering new material all the time. And to me, uh, I confess my complete ignorance about all of this before I started on this project, but it's been a real revelation to understand uh, the kind of traffic that was taking place between Northern Europe and uh, and uh, and North America, largely through you know the, the civil the Viking civilization, but I'd never understood how intense that traffic was. I mean, there were ships going back and forth, back and forth all the time, and again, things like uh, Gre uh, Gretchen's uh, Luca men mentioned. Uh, Gretchen's journey to to uh, to Rome after having given birth uh, to uh, Leif's brother's child in in North America. I imagine how incredible and fantastic this journey must have been to go from Greenland all the way uh, to to Rome, um, and that ties us to all the the thoroughways and lanes that Gretchen was talking about. Uh, uh, you know, how did you get to Rome in those days? Uh, uh, and and that, that's also very fascinating. But in, in a nutshell, it, it was really the intensity of the traffic on those sea lanes that really was a tremendous surprise to me. And so when I traveled, 
in those countries, in the footsteps of the Zenos, going to the Orkneys, going to the uh, Faroe Islands, uh, going to Iceland, going to Greenland and looking for traces of their passage and finding them usually, because you always do find stuff. It's remarkable uh, uh, what, what uh, happens out there. And just the other day, I think Luca t sent me a, a clipping when, you know, uh, the one of the fascinating uh, items in, in the Zeno narrative is, is the, of, um, of this uh, monastery in, uh, in Iceland. Uh, in Iceland, there were seven or eight very important monasteries starting from the 11th century on, onwards. And then they were destroyed after the Reformation. But in the time of the Zeno brothers, the monasteries were uh, the fulcrum of life in Iceland. Right. And there was one monastery in, in particular, which they described in great detail, great detail. Uh, and so I went to Iceland uh, looking for traces of this monastery because I thought, how is it possible that they could give us such a detailed um, description of it if it did not exist? It had to right. exist. And sure enough, I met a fascinating archaeologist by the name of uh, Steinun Christian Doktir, uh, who is a leading archaeologist in Iceland and who is the one who has done the most work on excavating the sites of these ancient monasteries. And she told me to go look at Thikabaya Klauster, which is a, a very specific place in southern uh, Iceland. And she said that the monastery I was looking for was probably in that area. And so I went there and uh, I spent a wonderful day uh, just walking around and, and looking for traces. There were lots of traces. But anyway, to make a long story short, only a, a few months ago, um, uh, it was announced that that um, uh, that this same archaeologist, Steinlund uh, Christian Dottir, has actually discovered the foundations of that monastery in uh, in Iceland. Am I correct, Lu Lu Luca? Yes, they and started so in 2015 and, uh, and it's what? still going on. Yeah. yeah, they started in 2015 and they're still going on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's fascinating. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it's an ongoing story and it's very rich and uh, it'll gradually trickle down into the history books. And, uh, Oh. Yes, and I, 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 I just want to say, make a point here that um, I think it's really important to understand that these people were not conquerors. These, the Zeno brothers were were traders. They were merchants. Exactly. Yeah. And what they wanted to do was get rich by finding resources and trading, and they knew how to trade. And I really, uh, you know, if you lo look at the, the, who these, what they, they did for a living. And uh, yes, uh, Earl Henry Sinclair was a martial uh, lord, but he also had to run an estate. He had to lead people. He had to negotiate with people. So I think that these earlier souls would have been more interested in surviving once they got there because that voyage is tough and developing a uh, network with the indigenous peoples that were there that would be mutually supported. And I absolutely believe that there would have been marriages between the populations. You, you know, people, when they see an opposite, you know, somewhat, somebody exotic, you know, the imagination, you know, they become very, very drawn to that other person mm -hmm. and see a lot of beauty and sophistication in a different way of expressing civilization that they're, they've not seen before. So, so I think when you're talking about the early explorers, uh, you know, it kind of takes it out of the realm of, of Christopher Columbus, which was uh, the beginnings of empire building. Yep. Yeah. A, different, a different ethos and, and a different purpose and reason for setting sail. Uh, and what I find so interesting about La Axen Meadows, if I pronounced it correctly, that's dated to, uh, uh, this came out recently, to 1020 AD. They, that's within months ago. And it's been termed as a repair ship repair station, which is an 
interesting. Now, this is the words of the archaeologists who are working on this site since the 1960s. So uh, if a ship repair station indicates, as Andrea was saying, travel, you know, plural ships right. and need to have a repair station. So it, it kind of opens up our thinking a little bit more about the courage of the Vikings, their capacity and skill set. They didn't, oh, not everybody lived. Ships went down, tragedies happened, but some of them did get through. And we know that they were all, uh, you know, they got as far as, as, as Constantinople, modern day Istanbul. And uh, they were, they were, uh, there were some Vikings who were hired to protect uh, the emperor there. And I think it scrawled on a, on a, on a, a, a balustrade or, you know, a bit of railing is basic, basically Sven was here, you know? <laughs> so I, that's, a, that's wild. That's absolutely wild. So they were further East and the name and the country, the name of Russia, they get their name from Rus, the Rus Vikings. And so you know, these people uh, uh, knew how to drive through rivers to the heart of important capitals such as Paris. They raided Paris. Uh, they got as far as Chateau de la Rochefoucauld, which was the reason why that castle was uh, begun its its construction in in uh, the uh, 900s. So if they could do that in Europe, why couldn't they have gone further? Uh, to uh, if we must end there, La Axe and Meadows. Mm -hmm. So, but but it's probable, and I think highly likely that they ventured further south into North American coastlines. So that's that's my two cents for it. For it. But I also believe that geography plays an important part of all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got the St. Lawrence River Valley, where all these important tribes and societies lived, and you've got yeah. further south the Hudson Valley. And the key to all of this um, uh, in in post uh, Viking era into into uh, Earl Sinclair's time and uh, further further um, episodes in in history, you've got the fur trade. Um, by Queen Elizabeth's time, the bear were dead in in England. Uh, the bear were almost extinct in France by that time. So fur uh, uh, was a commodity uh, akin to gold. And that's what drove early empire concepts uh, because uh, those early explorers were coming back wearing some of these garments that, that the Native Americans brought to them in trade. And um, uh, I, I believe eventually settlements would, grew and the Native Americans would go out, go hunting, bring their, their furs back to trade with the Europeans who may have felt it was too dangerous to go out there <laughs> to, to, you it know. It was. Yeah. <laughs> so eventually, these trades routes grew up. Uh, and uh, Stephen Sora references that heavily. And um, of course, Stephen Sora is is a backbone author to Luca's film series. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Verrazano and other uh, important key early explorers who were fur trading and some who we're not ever going to know the names of. Um, and I believe they all go back to the, the Dieppe, France, the port there. Uh, where where uh, a lot of embarkations to North America uh, seeking pelts uh, uh, and uh, trading post um, in, in Dieppe, France, on the coast. So so I've thrown a lot out there. And and um, uh, as as uh, Andreas said before we started, if I start ta talking too much, please tell me to stop. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Luca, where would you like to go from there? Uh, do you have? Um, I was uh, wondering if uh, Jeff has received the, the video about Princess Nina of Seborga and Seborga and Autopasha and Cremona. So um, the, 
I may have missed that. Uh, there is my behind the scenes that yeah, I, I have that one left, the behind the scenes one. Um, left. Well, well I will go to... on the other one first because you it's bet. more, if you'll let it's me more important. Yeah. She can send that to me real quick. I can bring it up. It will take me a moment <laughs> okay. to, to find that. So, Jeff, you might want to uh, turn off my microphone. Uh, there might be some noises here. Uh, uh, and perhaps Luca and, and Andrea can talk about something else for a moment. Okay. Well, I um, search for that. I did um, have a, I did have a few. Um, there are some questions that some of the folks have uh, that are watching have uh, brought up, and we'll get to those in just a moment too. Uh, one thing, you know, uh, in, in, you know, Gretchen was talking about, um, you know, uh, you know, going on and describing so much. But I tell you, this is the reason why this is so important that you do. Um, here's a Jacob. One of our the live streams are incredibly interesting. Uh, so much valuable information. And that's that's the key to this. And that's the thing that I uh, folks, you know, I've talked about this before. That's the, the reason why I do this show. Um, one of the main reasons is because I have an interest in these things. And then I find such wonderful people like this group that we have here today that come with this knowledge that can share it not only with me, but I want to share it with all of you. So. You know, Gretchen, please don't ever feel like you're just going on with something because you're always giving us an education. And my show has always been about, you know, fun and entertaining, and you might learn something in the process. And that's the key to it is learning something in the process. And we always seem to do that with wonderful guests. But uh, um, so that's the, don't ever think that you're going on about something because that's exactly why we do the, that, why I do these shows. Uh, you know, I was going to point out, too, that you talked about the fur trade, and that's something that here in northern Michigan, where I am, we have um, that has was well established a long ago. Um, there were Europeans here that were doing fur trades, and they built the uh, Fort Michelin-Mackinac and Fort Mackinac, and um, they were doing a lot of fur trade. The Palace of Zeno is one of the uh, grandest in that's Venice. Why it, um, the that's why it's so important that, uh, um, that you bring that up. Um, or interesting that you bring that up because that was something that was very prominent here in this region. Now, of course, this was many years later. Um, but uh, anyway, so oh, oh, I got somebody we got to. I think I think uh, the fur trade was also very active uh, in uh, between Greenland and uh, the coast of Labrador, uh, uh, starting in the 11th century, mm -hmm. once the uh, Greenlandic settlement developed. Uh, after the arrival of Leif and Eric the Red and, and, and his son Leif, um, every every summer they uh, they would uh, go on an expedition to Labrador in order to uh, get uh, two things: basically furs for the winter and timber, because on Greenland there was uh, practically no no timber. Right. They had no timber to build houses, no timber to build boats. And so um, uh, from a very early on, there were these uh, summer expeditions starting in May um, of, of Vikings going over, um, or Greenlanders going over to North America and coming, coming back around uh, uh, August. But it was essential for them to be able to go to North America to, to get supplies that they, they didn't have right. in the, uh, in Greenland, and it was much easier for them to go there than have to wait for the ships coming from Iceland. Uh, because there was a constant flow of ships from Iceland to Greenland. There were about yeah. eight ships a year, roughly, at the height of the traffic. Well, at right. the height of the Greenlandic civilization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from Norway, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you talk about the shipbuilding yard and and uh, and port and things of that nature. You know that was that was your super highway of the time, and I think that was actually even mentioned dur during the film uh, that that was the super highway of, of the time. And for the uh, Zeno brothers, our Zen brothers, to be able to become part of this, who better to assist uh, the Sinclair family, Henry Sinclair? than people who knew their way around. I mean, you talked about how far and wide uh, these brothers went. I mean, just incredible. And so, um, you know, who better for them to uh, or to have on his staff or helping him uh, would be these two brothers that would go around and, and knew all these places and knew these routes. I mean, 
it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, they knew a lot about shipping as well, about, you know, yes. ships and trade. I mean, they- Map making. They, yeah. I mean, they'd spent a lifetime trading in the Mediterranean and, and they knew a lot about uh, ships. But for them, it was a new experience. So yep. they must have been fast learners because uh, uh, the Atlantic world is, is very different from what they were used to. Um, mm -hmm. I did send you that link, Jeff, okay. if you'd like to play it. I, f I did find it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll bring that up here. Um, if you want to kind of preference it just a little bit while I do that, I'm going to mute myself, and then I'm going to get this thing ready. If you want to just kind of maybe get, it, get us a uh, lead in on it. Uh, Saborga, uh, Luca introduced me to Saborga and to Matilda of Tuscany. These are uh, – the language barrier has been a block in – understanding some of these topics, but Saborga uh, is a principality and it's within eyesight of Monaco. Mm -hmm. It's in Italy, but it's up on a, a high uh, hill and a very uh, uh, charming medieval uh, ha hamlet or village. Mm -hmm. But the, the Templar has played a large role uh, in Saborga and Luca was able to have a wonderful interview with the elected pr princess, Nina, mm -hmm. and they, they um, received him very well. And I, I, I can't say enough about how terrific this, uh, his interview with her went. She was, uh, Luca, I feel like you should be saying some of these things. Um, if, if you'd like to say oh, anything. are saying long. all things very well that I let you speak all along. <laughs> so that's the reason. Yeah, but um, I will go uh, with the video if Jeff is ready. Yep, I'm ready. Yeah. All right. Yeah, this is, for, you know, I had never even heard of this place again until mm -hmm. your film. And this, again, the education that we're getting, folks. All right. Well, we're gonna sometimes run this. in Italy, too. They don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to run this one here. Uh, and this one is a little bit longer, but very, very informative. All right, so back and enjoy this one as I play. The Principality of Saborga sits high above the Italian Riviera, and its neighbor, glittering Monaco, is within sight. Saborga is steeped in the history of the Knights Templar. Its patron is Bernard de Clairvaux, a powerful benefactor of the Templars. The Principality is little known to the English-speaking world, its charm and secrets hidden until now. Author Zena Halpern of Oak Island fame stated that Bernard had traveled to Saborga and that the original Templars hid ancient texts and relics of John the Baptist in the remote village.
introduce myself. I'm Nina, the Princess of Seborga. Seborga is a tiny principality close to the French border, close to the Principality of Monaco. Um, it's an enclave between um, inside Italy. Uh, we are located 500 meters above the sea level. Uh, Seborga has 320 inhabitants. It's a principality since 954, and I got elected the princess by the population in um, 2019. Seborga has a very ancient history. It exists since 954. And obviously now we are in 2022. Um, it's not the same time as previously. Uh, but we still stick to our historic uh, roots. History is very important to Seborga. Uh, we still very much have our traditions, like the National Day celebrations, which is 20th of August, uh, where I would come with a horse carriage. We have the flags. We have the historic dresses. We have the Templar Knights. The Templars are a very big part of the history of Seborga. And as you can see on our flag, uh, the Principality flag is blue and white, and it's represented by nine lines, which represent the nine Templars who have gathered here together in Seborga. So you have nine uh, lines, white and blue. They're representing the Templars. Also, if you walk through the village, you will see everywhere the designs of the Templars, either on the walls or on, uh, on every side, as you can see here, the Templar cross on the floor. Um, nowadays, we have several orders, and um, the Templars, for us, they should represent, uh, they should defend the crown. So even nowadays, the Templars are very important for the Principality of Seborga, since they're part of our history. And um, we still have part of them. They, they would come and uh, represent themselves on the 20th of August, which is our national day. Uh, they gather together with their coat of arms and, and their coat. My wish for the principality is that our dream will come true of the independence, that we regain our independency back, and um, that we have happiness and that we get fulfilled all our wishes we, we hope for, the hotel project, uh, work for, for the local people that they can stay here, um, develop all our projects we have in mind, and um, continue like this. The Knights of the Tau, founded in 1075, still protect Saborga today. The great Countess Matilda de Canosa created the chivalric order and the town of Alto Pascio. The Countess was connected at the highest levels and was the aunt of Godfrey de Bouillon, first king of Jerusalem. <laughs> Was the warrior countess Matilda protecting the secrets of Mary Magdalene and Ren Machetto at Alto Pascio? Is this why she built an entire town and created a new military order who would protect pilgrims and tend to them in their new hospital? Kingmaker and diplomat, the countess was famed for her blonde red hair and ferocity as a military leader. Matilda's force of will can be felt today. It is easy to track the spread of Matilda's order and how she influenced later branches. She is the unsung founder of the Knights Templar. The order spread outward to Orval in Belgium, where she gave the original Templars land before they settled Alto Pascio. The Templars wore the Tau Cross until 1128. With over 1,000 holdings across Europe, they would likewise play significant roles in the kingdoms of England, Scotland, and Ireland, eventually joining forces with the powerful Sinclair family. Thank you. 
The Church of San Sigismondo, Cremona, Italy, the church where Zena Halpern's documents would take their name, having been hidden for 500 years. The Cremona documents' most famous pages contain maps of Oak Island and the potential location of sacred treasures. The families intertwined in this intrigue were the Sforza, Medici, and Visconti, their joint lines producing royal lineages and settlers of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. Gretchen, are you sure that you're not a uh, a, a descendant of uh, of Matilda? <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Am I on mute? Nope. No. You're good. There uh, you go. Because well, Je Jeff, you. Luke, and Gretchen, I I really um, I'm so sorry, but I really have to go. Okay, um, no problem. We're about I to wrap up here. Anyway, it's been lovely to talk to you all and. Uh, uh, bring brings back a lot of memories. This last clip was uh, amazing. I, I knew nothing about the Seborga princess. I can't wait to go to Alto Pasho and uh, check it out for myself. Um, anyway, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me on the on the show. It's been and, our pleasure. Uh, and I hope to see you all and uh, hear from you very soon. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Andrea. Gonna, I look at my see us again. Uh, there, Andrea. In January, yes. Yes, Thank I you so much. A real honor. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. So uh -huh. I tell you what, and that was, that was very, very good. And I, and I say, you know, when they were showing the pictures, uh, you know, uh, and, and talking about Matilda, when I was watching the episode, um, episode number three, I thought that during the episode, I thought, you know, Gretchen could go because she could be related, you know, for sure, because of your the uh, the spirit you have. And uh, and, you know, she said that uh, it was said that she was a great military leader. I don't know if you're a great military leader, but I can see you doing that. <laughs> she is a, a what I would say, an archetypal figure that resounds with me quite strongly. Uh, part of my work is inspired by Mary Magdalene as well. Uh, again, she has become a powerful archetypal figure. But I, I actually did not know about Matilde until uh, Luca introduced me to her. And I, I am definitely gripped by her story. She had property in Belgium. And that is the connection there with the DNA of, of the original Nine Knights. And then she created the Order of the Tao, and they were there for a time, and Saborga as well. And of course, then it, every, all, everything became uh, settled in, in France, Paris, as the headquarters for the Templars uh, became, became uh, uh, cemented to, to that. So right. everything you've read about, heard about, it's always about Paris, the Paris Temple. It's always about Scotland. Uh, but there are other stories that are pivotal and critical to understanding the Cremona documents and to understanding Oak Island. And this is one, one of those, one of those stories. And these people, they're all related and uh, m my dna i don't know how uh you know i don't know my 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 family background past a certain point but um uh her background is uh norse uh the same as as uh, R Rolo marrying into the royal family of Paris, becoming the Duke of Normandy. So, you know, she has that connection there mm -hmm. with that DNA. And, um, uh, of course, you know, through marriage and, and uh, Italian, uh, I might be getting some of that a bit confused, but the, the, the Normans invaded uh, Sicily. Uh, they conquered uh, large parts of Italy. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's where, where her uh, light colored eyes come from and blondy reddish hair comes from. Um, and mine comes from Northwestern, Western Europe as well. So, so it's, um, 
but uh, yeah, she's remarkable. The more I read about her, I'm just <laughs> astonished by what that woman did. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, and and she's. If you're looking for a picture, anybody anybody who's steeped in Eleanor of Aquitaine, she's Eleanor of Aquitaine back a hundred years. Oh wow! <laughs> so I mean, you know, that's the kind of 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 woman, you know, one of the most powerful women in Europe, basically, mm -hmm. of her time, and uh, alive during the time of Bernard de Clairvaux. And to have Saborga choose August 20th as their important day, and that's the feast day of Bernard de Clairvaux, uh, mm -hmm. is significant. And it, it's, uh, it's just so in incredible. And um, uh, Zina uh, was not able to go to Saborga, but yeah. I know she that's would have man. just loved it. Um, and uh, Princess Nina uh, is elected for seven years, and she's actually from Germany. She's an entrepreneur. Uh, she uh, rides, uh, she's a horsewoman, uh, and she has been able to play a significant role in drawing attention to Saborga. Uh, they were never legally properly grandfathered into the nation, modern nation of Italy. And they want to be uh, mm -hmm. sovereign unto themselves right. as Monaco is recognized in France. So it, it uh, legally, uh, it is a separate principality. So it's, it's intriguing. Yeah. yeah, she mentioned that during the, that episode there, that that is their wish. Uh, mm -hmm. one of their wishes uh so that's yes. i really hope they can get that uh, and be granted that for sure um we do have they a few are, questions they, they, they i'm are sorry legally right they are legally right yes because mm -hmm. the documents uh, are on our side and principality mm -hmm. side but it's up to the government of italy <laughs> right right and sometimes that may be difficult. Uh, I don't know about Italy, but I know about doing things over here. And sometimes it's very <laughs> difficult to get anything done. Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, I was going to say that, um, you know, uh, with the time we have left, I wanted to, there were some great questions uh, yeah, that were uh, people were uh, putting out. And I wanted to ask a couple of them. Um, and Linda was trying to gather some of them together because they were coming very early. And I asked folks to kind of hold off a little bit uh, till we got to this point. Um, but one of the questions was from Tom Burns, and he asked, what are your thoughts relating uh, to a possible connection between Sinclair's arrival in the Atlantic Canada to the creation of the legend of Glooscap? Uh, that is significant. I... Uh, years ago so i cannot give you the episode and uh, uh but i saw an inter I, I saw an interview with a prominent mcmah uh elder and he's also a a teaching professor at a university and i i this was actually an ancient aliens uh, uh episode um oh, okay but he's he's uh they did an entire okay an entire special entire show on who was glues cap mm -hmm. now now yes it, it's um the 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 creator god of the tribe of the peoples may have been interlaced with Sen with earl sinclair these people probably had never seen a sail before or oh. hadn't seen a sail in a very long time that would have been viking era Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the Vikings also also rode uh, when there was no wind. So conceivably, uh, he, they could have uh, seen a sailing vessel come up, and it would have appeared miraculous. Mm -hmm. That uh, his uh, uh, Earl Sinclair's culture was. Uh, uh, different in its organizational capacities, different technology of, of being able to quarry stone, of building, of, of, of farming. All of these uh, would have been very exotic to, to the tribe. 
And if there's any, uh, you know, indication of a, a meshing of the culture, it's definitely in Rosalind Chapel of, of the carvings of maize, aloe, uh, other, other symbols that are, are not supposed to be there. They're quite strange, um, mm -hmm. some Templar related. So, so uh, it, it's possible that Glue's Cap, the creator god, became morphed with more information that had been inspired by Earl Sinclair. Mm -hmm. So I hope that that makes sense. Yeah, it does actually. And I think, you know, that it, there is a lot of similarity and a lot of uh, possible connection there for sure. I've done uh, a lot of comparative religion studies. Mm -hmm. No religion is born out of the ground it fully uh, 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 complete. Uh, it changes over time. It morphs over time. Uh, people make decisions, whether the, the Council of Nicaea in 325 uh, in Rome about what was going to be the Western uh, Bible was was discussed there. Some books were excluded, others were, were accepted. Mm -hmm. And that was very different as an experience uh, from uh, uh, Constantinople at the time. Ethiopia has a far larger Bible than the Western European Bible uh, because they included the Book of Enoch for one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they've got 80 books versus the Western uh, Bible that has 66 books in it, books. So, so no religion stands still and is static. So if, if those uh, peoples uh, uh, felt that Earl Sinclair, uh, perhaps they could see aspects of their God through Earl Sinclair. That's a possibility. And those ideas that, that Sinclair brought got morphed into their own culture and were explained through Gulu's cup. So... Um. Jan asked a question. Uh, she said, Gretchen, do you um, get uh, grants to your research and were you affiliated with any university? Thank or were you. they all just very motivated? Were you just very motivated? Um, unfortunately, I was just very motivated. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am a member of the British Archaeology Association here in England because I enjoy reading their uh, yearly journal, which is is quite quite something. Uh, so I do try to stay uh, aware of the academic community here. Mm -hmm. I do uh, uh, wish that that um, uh, I had access to grant money. Um, that's uh, grant money is very difficult to achieve. I have a Patreon account where you can sign up for as little as a dollar. Um, I'm very grateful to my 12 current patrons. I have two in particular that back me up occasionally um, off the radar. And they, I'm quite grateful that they believe in, in me as a, a person of integrity, as a researcher, as a writer, um, and uh, they're, they're women, and I am grateful. One of them said to me, you're my ears and eyes on, uh, you're my uh, ears and eyes and boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful to be able to fulfill that role. So uh, as Luca is, is well aware, funding for this type of research is very difficult. I can imagine. And a lot of it is not academically accepted. Um, uh, it, it, which makes it even harder to yeah. apply for a grant, Absolutely. if not impossible. Yep. So I am privately funded um, and uh, grateful for, for the patrons I, I, I do have. Patreon.com uh, is uh, um, where you can go. Just look me up on Patreon.com. You do have to sign up. You can stay for a month and go again. You can sign up for three months if you'd like. There's also a donation button on my website, GretchenCornwall.com. That's a straight one-off donation if you would yep. like to to assist me with my travel costs. Um, there's a, a cost to keeping a website running, uh, updating equipment, 
um, all of these things uh, are are a cost of which um, I have personally borne over the la over yep. the last decades, and um, I, yeah, same thing here. You know, yes, you know that well. So at the <laughs> moment, at the moment um, uh, Bonnie Hinman and I are looking for assistance in carbon dating yes. this medieval statue. Yep. He is a very, very interesting statue. Uh, won't go into that now, but um, uh, we did a show on it, so they can go check out the show yeah, we exactly, did on it. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I, I would like to draw a line under that, but yes, come to my website if you if you even want five dollars. You know, a five dollar donation would would lift believe it or not, what I'm doing, um, a few dollars would lift what I'm doing if a lot of people decided to, to feel generous, uh, in, uh, you know, for a few dollars, five dollars, whatever. So, but uh, on that note, maybe, um, I know there are questions uh, as well, but uh, Luca, did you have anything you wanted to say about episode four? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes uh, you can introduce about that. And especially, we're going to have a special show in January, according with Jeff, mm -hmm. uh, hosting up to seven to eight people. There's going to be um, a bunch of us on, yep. Yeah, mostly women. <laughs> it's all about uh, good return behind our door here. So we're going to invite all the writers who wrote about her. And uh, if she wants, also our uh, American actress, uh, Amy Johnson, who uh, is going to portray the character of Goodred very soon. Yes, I have, actually have a picture of her right here. Yeah. She's stunning. Yeah. Amy Johnson. Yeah. She's an actress and she yeah portrays... Uh, a, well, I'm sorry. Who does she portray again? I, I'm... Goodred Torbjarnar Dottir. Thank you. I knew I was never going to be able to say that. It's kind of complicated to pronounce yes. it. But, but uh, you know, uh, Amy Erin Johnson did already other um, movies in the past, so they're still available on the web. Yeah. Uh, briefly, uh, if I if if I may, um, I I have been to Chateau de la Rochefoucauld. It's hard to do this in opposite. That's a photo I took on a stunning day of the chateau. So I do have uh, things like this available on my website. Um, I uh, also have signed books uh, for sale, person, person, uh, personalized, if you want to give them as a gift. So I'll just drop that in. Christmas is coming up. Solstice is coming up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because I'm in <laughs> England, because I'm in England, uh, it does take 40 days for that to reach you because I send it via media mail, which is is mm -hmm. literally on a ship. So, yep. it, so if you're interested in having a signed copy, personalized for the person you'd like to give it to, that is available online as well as uh, other items. Um, I've I also have uh, decorative items that are also you know magnets, and that's a photograph I took at Kidderminster Church of a Templar knight, and uh, had been a Templar church at one point. So. Uh, the the photograph became the cover of my first book. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, but I do like to travel to these locations and uh, find out forgotten history from the architecture and carvings that have been left by those. There's that have clues gone all over the place. There are, and like Luca as well. Aware and, of that. and you are both, you know, involved as well as Andrea in going out and finding these and then sharing that with us. And that's really the blessing of it all for us, really. Thank you. So, yeah, good God. You know, I really hope that you can, you know, uh, and selling your books. You're an author. You've written many books on the subjects. Uh, there's a couple. There's one behind you of the Sangreal. Uh, you know, so in many ways that folks can help out Gretchen and uh, to help her continue this. And as Luca said, and Luca as well, because, you know, this stuff, it does cost money. And unfortunately, much of the time we end up paying for it out of our own pocket just because of the passion we have to get that out. So uh, any help is always, uh, always uh, uh, well appreciated. Uh, and as far as that goes, even for me, you know, doing what I do, this it, it has a cost to it. And I bear that cost uh, most of the time. I do have a few patrons myself, and I do appreciate them very, very much, as I know you do. Um, one of the other questions we had, and I and this may have been um, more for um, 
Andrea, um, and who is now gone, but uh, Anfold asked the question, does anyone know of someone who has analyzed or studied the details of the ships of the Zeno brothers and Henry Sinclair, the size, structure, and material, uh, and so on? Uh, do either of you have any of that? Uh, or is it I, uh, I don't have a, a name of a book offhand. I, no. I would delve into a book for greater detail but i have there are many websites online and organizations that recreate these ships from from different timelines and they uh the, the if you look up cog ship mm -hmm. you can read a great deal about that online and it did have a larger base and that was done so that uh, merchant goods could be trans transferred Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, there are quite a lot of knowledgeable people out there on shipbuilding across different ages and times. Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely go out online and look at that. Look up some useful books on Amazon. Um, I, I've done a lot of reading and studying myself on, on the subject because it's important to understand uh, the, the sailing vessels. Um, but I would definitely, you'll have to do some research. I can't think of a book off the top of my head. Yeah, no problem. Um, and uh, we also had a, another question. A robot asked this question. Have you ever come across a legend of the Knights Templar placing gold coins under newly planted trees in new countries? I've never heard of that before. No, that's a new one on me. Uh, yeah, I'm. We're, I'm going to have to ask that robot. I'm going to have to ask that of Andre and see if he knows uh, of that. I have not heard of that either. So yeah, uh, Knights Templar placing gold coins under newly planted trees in new countries. Very interesting. Um, yeah, and uh, do you, do you mind real quick? I'm going to grab another one of these questions. But the statue is it is it appropriate to to show that again? I mean, if absolutely. It, and we folks, we did a show on this uh, where Gretchen talked about this piece, and we had also the interview with uh, your friend. I'm sorry, what was your friend's name again? Her name is Bonnie Hinman, and she you. owned the statue for seven years. She sent it to me last Christmas, mm -hmm. and I've had it since then. And um, I have a book coming out in December that includes further information on him and also Royston Cave. But he's a really interesting piece. You can see he's wearing a uh, what is what is historically called a pot helmet mm -hmm. over a chainmail coif. He's wearing a gamb gambeson. And they see the vertical, uh, it's hard to do in reverse. The, rever the, the vertical stitching is there. Mm -hmm. It's basically a cloth garment that's layers and layers of cloth that has been stitched together to uh, uh, dispel the energy in a blunt uh, strike. Mm -hmm. so, so it's very Ever early on. Mm -hmm. um, someone else who looked at this misunderstood that this right here was was uh plate armor beginnings of plate armor it's not it's a cloak it's a mantle and you can see a horizontal bar going across right there mm -hmm. um this well, this was worn for centuries from the you know the saxons were wearing these on the on you know the dark ages uh, or early medieval as it's called now all the way up through uh you know the 1400s when stitching and knowledge of of tailoring became more specific um uh it needs scientific dating about its age but but i believe this thing is 1100s 1200s because of what he's wearing mm -hmm. and it does need scientific test testing you can see there is a cross on the back that I believe is Templar. Um, and he is obviously sitting outside. Um, uh, he is at a, a tilt um, and he is uh, sitting right next to a felled tree. And there is a, a carved shield on there as well. It's really hard to see some of the details on camera really tough. Um, I've spent a lot of time looking at him with the naked eye uh donations yeah uh absolutely but please earmark that you want that money to go to the dating of the statue i don't have a specific uh 
at this juncture, I'll, I'll add that to my website, you know, donating for the statue. Uh, but we would, we would very much appreciate a partner in that. And there is also on the top of his head, which we've not delved, sorry, not delved into greatly, but you cannot see it with the naked eye, but there is a um, invisible ink on it. And I've got pictures of this that'll be in the book. There'll wow. be a later video of it. And it's the Hebrew letter Y. Oh, wow. Now, the only way you can see it is by the right lighting. And it's tough to do. And I have yet to get the ratio right myself. I'm relying on a photograph that Bonnie has mm -hmm. to share this. And that letter Y, uh, it, it brings up a whole nother subject of, of issues. Um, but miniature art, miniature writing. I was in the British Museum um, uh, recently and took photographs of a ring that memorialized the sadness felt when Charles II died. And it was a poem about his demise and it fit into a, a, a ring, tiny, tiny little ring. And you open up the lid and you can read this teeny tiny little poem. So they would use quartz crystal to magnify and and sharpened bone to to as a stylus, and this goes all the way back to ancient. I can't imagine Egypt. that so ancient small. Egypt. I cannot. And so so you know we really do need some uh, scientific information. I can talk about what he's wearing. There are a couple of historic personages that he may represent, and in brief, he may have been repurposed to represent something else entirely. And Bonnie Hinman has spent seven years with this and uh, ha firmly believes there's a connection between this statue as a three-dimensional map and Oak Island. And uh, just briefly, I'm sorry to keep going on about this, but there is an indented um, blade right here um, so an indented blade um, and an interesting, you know, little, little uh, uh, indented, almost, it looked like somebody took a needle and burned that into it. Is it a tree? Is it a mining shaft? Uh, but there is a degree, you know, represented here that I've got to study. Um, uh, but there's so much about this piece. Um, in fact, I, you know, I'm, I'm finalizing my writing on him as we know uh, about him uh, uh, just today, really. Uh, but it's a, it's a journey. Um, we need some information about, uh, we, it's oak, we know that, it is oak. Um, but I'm, I would be surprised if he's not 1100s into the 1200s. Okay. So anyway, um, in, in short, and I will put up a link on my website, but if you do want to donate specifically for carbon dating him, say so in the comments or send me an email to that effect. And um, starting to, you know, get a little late for me here. So, uh, well, mm -hmm. not terribly late, but, it, but, you know, I'm starting to get tired. So I'll, I will add a link uh, uh, proper to the website for that purpose. Okay, good. Yeah, Enfold it is. It is one solid piece. So that's something that they... It's a uh, chunk. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, there was I'll go one more question here, and then we'll kind of wrap up. It says, uh, has anyone looked at the, and I don't know anything about this, so maybe you will. Uh, has anyone looked at the uh, Kirk Wall Scroll? It's there's housed in the Kirk Wall Lodge in Orkney. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a book out about it. It's been a long time since I've read it by Andrew Sinclair, mm -hmm. and it's a fascinating read. Um, and... Uh, Certainly, there is much to be gleaned from his book on on the, the scroll. Absolutely. So uh, the Sinclair family uh, is is fascinating, and there is the Sinclair uh, uh, clan in the north, and then there is Earl Sinclair in the south, associated with Roslyn uh, outside of Edinburgh, uh, and he owns uh, the the remains of the castle and the chapel it's privately owned so there is a separate there are separate branches 
uh, of the same family. So Andrew Sinclair, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I would definitely look up that book on the on the scroll. Okay. Yeah, Enfold asked if there was any secret compartments. Well, we have. If there is, nobody's found it yet. I don't so. know. I I do not want to cause damage to it. Oh, I and know. I, That's I, a thing. Glass dome. Uh, he he lives in a museum quality glass hand blown expensive dome, uh, which Bonnie uh, purchased, and an expensive uh, uh, chemical free base. Uh, so it's a he's in a museum quality uh, in, uh, environment to protect him from dust, um, but but yeah he does need some scientific uh, energy thrown at him absolutely. Okay, so Luca, so episode three it was released uh, on the thirteenth just a couple of days ago. It is available on Amazon um, along with episodes one and two and the other uh, you know films that yeah. you've done. Yeah, we're going to have a release in January, end of January, and uh, the very last one in June. Okay, so there's going to be five altogether, folks. Yeah, uh, season And I tell you, they just keep getting better and better uh, as we go here. This episode, this particular episode, I and I have all three now, but this particular episode um, was, uh, you know, so far the best, and I can only imagine that they're going to get even better as we go through this series. These are... This is a fascinating look at um, the Templars and uh, their their legacy, the rise and fall, all the way through from start to finish. And I think this is very important. If you are interested in at the in the uh, Templars at all, obviously you're here watching this show right now. But also, you know, this is something. It's a must-have, in my opinion. This is a series that must have. Are, is there any? Uh, chance that uh other than amazon is it going to be maybe come to a network at any point do you think yes or? as i mentioned before uh, when uh, the series is going to be completed mm -hmm. uh is going to go also on all the uh, web uh, platforms around the world in different languages but we have to finish with amazon prime be the first okay fantastic so yeah episode number four coming out in january and as you heard Lucas say, we are going to have uh, Luke and I are going to be surrounded by our seven or eight women uh, that are all part of that episode and the series coming up to that point. So it's going to be great. We're looking forward to it. We will get you the date of that show as soon as we know it. And he has a release date for the actual uh, the film uh, episode number four itself coming out. So um, uh, anything else you'd like to say for, as we wrap up here? Um, just that. Um... Episode five, we will, uh, we will work strictly with Gretchen. Uh, she will come to France and Italy. Mm -hmm. So we're going to work together closer and together with Tanya as well. And the rest of the film crew that we started in episode one and two. So it's going to be like a kind of reunion, conclusion. That'd be nice. And, yeah, I'm sorry today I didn't speak very much, but as you can see, I don't have much voice. So <laughs> I'm sorry well, about you, that. You did wonderful. So, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, Tanya, Tanya was, uh, she was in episode two, correct? Is that one and two. Both one and two, yeah. And I does, and she doesn't speak English, I don't think yet. So she has no. to get working on <laughs> No, I, I, I will such... find a way. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. we'll find a way. Yeah, it's... um. It was a privilege to to write the narrative for this, and a a great experience. Mm -hmm. And I uh, I just enjoyed every moment of 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 putting in everything I could into the into the narrative, and uh, uh, the vocals of Martin Martin's voice were were wonderful. Yeah, he's uh, perfect. I've role. just Very appreciated good. working on this with Luca and really happy he approached me Thank and you. I can't wait to uh, uh, work with you again, Luca, in, in France and in Italy. So, and I just want to say thank you to everybody today who's, who's here and anybody who will be catching up on us in, on YouTube, on Jeff's channel. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I'll Same share the link with you guys. Hand. Yeah, yeah, it's been fascinating. And again, and, and I just, uh, and I have to say to uh, Luca and Gretchen that I am very honored uh, that you would come to my show to be able to put this out to the world and let, you know, get the announcement out that these are out there. I really appreciate that. I'm humbled by the fact that you would come here 
uh, and on my platform and do this. And I thank you so very much for that. Uh, folks, this has, been a, a thing. <laughs> this has been a wonderful afternoon uh, we got to spend, and we will see more uh, coming up of Luca and uh, also uh, Gretchen and all the team, Andre, and all the team that he has assembled to put this great piece of work together. And again, we appreciate all of you that have come here today for this. This will be out on YouTube. You can watch it again if you'd like and uh, review some of the episode clips that we put in there for you. Um uh oh linda just sent me a message here and i was just okay so all right no she was i don't know did you want me to actually announce that or say that <laughs> um but again this is a woken one thank you very much but uh, yeah again this has been fascinating time a couple of hours has just gone by so quickly um but thank you folks for being here with us today on the show and uh don't forget uh, that uh, we will be right here uh, on this channel we are wednesday night we're getting very close to the season opener of the curse of oak island and of course we'll be talking about each and every one of those episodes right after they air and maddie blake will be joining us for the very first episode on uh the 16th when we recap he's going to be on the show's on this on the 15th and we're going to recap it on the 16th and maddie blake will be here with us for that wow. so we are excited to have maddie on the show he's been around a couple times we really appreciate him very much uh, again, thank you, Luca. Thank you, Gretchen. And again, Andre, are you gone? But thank you very much for being on the show with us tonight. You folks have a great rest of your weekend, and we will catch you next time right here on the Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.